So I'm going to talk about honeybee genetics, why and how those genetics matter. And this isn't going to be a really super dense chromosome by chromosome kind of thing. It's going to be some really basic things about bee reproduction and their genetics and how they affect <laughs> things that you as a beekeeper are interested in. This thing worked a minute ago. There we go. Come on. There we go. Okay, so everything in genetics starts with mating, right? All the animals starts with mating. Um, queens are unique in the animal kingdom where they multiple mate. Um, you know, some of you know that cats will do this too. They'll have kittens from several fathers in one litter. <laughs> Multiply that exponentially into bees. You know, like your cats will have one or two black ones and all the rest are tabbies and you wonder how that happened. Well, cats kind of cat around. <laughs> Queen bees really cat around. Um, they want to mate at least with 15 to 40 different drones. And a lot of people think they will go on one mating flight they can actually go on multiple mating flights. And there are mechanisms within the queen bee that let her know how well she has been mated. And a lot of it has to do with the volume of semen that's injected and also how the uh, workers treat her when she comes back. When she comes back, they actually massage that queen's body to move everything where it needs to go. And they clean up anything that spills on the outside too. So it's, it's quite a process that involves a lot of bees. Drone congregation areas. This is where the drones go to hang out. Um, the drones do more than just sit in your colony and eat the honey and poop. They, uh, they will make several flights out to drone congregation areas per day, you know, depending on how much fuel they can put, on their, put in their tank, i.e. honey, before they run out of energy. And they will fly out and what they found um, most of this information is from uh, Lawrence Connor's book, um, Bee Sex Essentials, just to let you know what the source is on this. They will gather in specific areas. Um, Dale knows where two of them are. One, he was sitting at a stop sign and a drone fell on the hood of his car. And he knew it just made it because they die right when they mate. Boom, landed on the hood of the car. Um, but they gather there by the hundreds or thousands, and the queens seek out these areas, and they can smell them by pheromones. And furthermore, it has been found that different races of bees, the drones will gather at different altitudes. So when you worry about your pure Russian queen, or your pure Carnegie queen, or your pure Bugfast queen, or whatever, going out and mixing with whatever's out there, she will tend to mate with bees that are about the same race as she is. But there's always exceptions. You know, this is a little bit of randomness in nature. Um, flyways. Flyways are kind of like highways in the sky. You know how in uh, Back to the Future 2, um, Doc and Marty show up in the future and they're flying along what looks like a freeway in the sky. That's kind of what a flyway is. They'll fly in, the drones will fly in these paths um, because they know where the mating area is and or the congregation area, and they'll fly a straight line back and forth, trying to get the most bang for their buck out of their uh, attempt to achieve their goal in life, mating once. And uh, the queen will also follow these flyways, and she also gets mated in these flyways. So they don't always fly at altitude in these flyways, so they can get mated with, like a Carnival and Queen can get mated with an Italian drone or something in that flyway. But that would be one out of 15 to 40. So that's not always a giant change in the makeup of what the colony is going to look like. Some people think the mating will, hap mating will happen in the hive. It will not. Um, the Queen specifically will come out of the hive and fly the opposite direction that her drones are going. And then further, she will fly further than her drones typically will to a congregation area to make sure that she doesn't mate with her 
offspring, kind of, sort of, sons. Sons. Yeah. Um, and they do that on they do that on purpose. So sometimes people will do uh, instrumental insemination to overcome that, and that's risky because some <coughs> undesirable traits and behaviors will become apparent when you start back breeding into their own sons. So it's best to get drones from other hives or other bee yards if you're going to do things like AI. And queens will go on mating flights until she has mated well, if she's able to. Now this year was a, a year where, if she can, kind of came into play. How much water fell out of the sky between March, April, and May this year? Way too much. Way too Bees don't fly really well when it rains like that. And they get knocked out of the sky. And if they don't go out, they kind of miss a window when they can get mated, or they'll get bumped off, or they don't get mated very well. And I heard of a lot of supersedures this year. And that's because maybe they had a queen go out and were able to get mated, but she didn't get mated really well. So they let her live and let her lay long enough to make some eggs so they can make a new queen. And they opt the other one. Okay, so the advantage of, advantages of multiple mating. Um, you like to have genetic diversity. Um, you know, people make jokes about living in the Ozarks or living in the Cascades or any mountainous area about inbreeding. Um, this is a real thing with bees. You want to have a deep gene pool because you get lower disease rates, because you get different behaviors that help the bees combat diseases and you get different attributes to immune systems. Um, this would be all diseases, interestingly enough. There's different resistances to nosema, different resistances to mites, American fowl brood, European fowl brood, etc. And there are genetically specialized tasks in the hive. We're going to talk about that more later. That's kind of what leads to being able to make more honey and to have gentle bees and have the right number of drones, things like that. Okay, so sex alleles. Human sex is determined by the X and Y chromosome. Most of us are familiar with this. It's kind of a high school, junior high, biology kind of thing. Two X's means you're a female. X and Y means you're a male. All the eggs in a female are X's and men can produce X's and Y in the sperm cells. Um, the Y's actually have a little bit of an advantage because they're a little bit lighter, but there's also a little less material. Make whatever joke you want to about that. Um, but that's how you determine sex. For the most part, we have two sexes in humans. There are examples of XYY. Um, they grow up to look like normal adults, but they tend to be very aggressive. And um, if you've seen a alien movie, is it like the third alien movie? There's a prison full of XYY people that have committed a large number of crimes and things. XXY is actually... Son of Sam. Yeah, Son of Sam. Things like that, yeah. You get that kind of maladaptive behavior um, from an over abundance of the testosterone driven behaviors. XXY is actually called Turner syndrome. Um, they usually don't live. If they do, it's not for very long. Um, it's, it's just not an adaptive thing. So we have two sex alleles. Bees have 16 to 20. Wow, that must make it complicated. It makes it complicated. Um, Two different alleles and the right food makes a worker or a queen. So if you get two different alleles and you get royal jelly all the way until that cell caps, you get to be a queen. If you have two different alleles and you get three days of royal jelly, and actually studies have shown that the royal jelly for workers is a little bit different than the stuff that they give to queens, they get that for three days and then they go back to um, worker food. That's how you get a worker. And just one allele makes a drone. 
usually a, a drone is an unfertilized egg, right? So that's one allele. Mm -hmm. So if we go A through Q, if you have one P allele, you'll get a drone. If you get uh, a D and a G, you'll get a worker. And lots of combinations. You push the arrow. Sometimes I talk ahead of myself. So drones, <coughs> the result of one sex allele in that egg, like I said. Most commonly, this is a result of a queen laying an unfertilized egg. It can be da, 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 the laying worker syndrome, mm -hmm. um, where a hive doesn't have a queen, and then the workers can be triggered to start laying. And you usually spot this by multiple eggs and cells, or they're off to the side, and things like that. Um, and you almost always have more than one laying worker. There's many laying workers, so you can't just catch the one and kill her. You've got a real problem on your hand. You can get a queen laying a fertilized egg that has two zygotes of the same allele. So you can have an O and an O, or a B and a B, or a C and a C, and that would make a male. The workers don't let them live, though. The nurse bees detect that, and they eat the egg of the larva. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this is, you know, Dale was talking about how sometimes they'll eat them for the protein. This can be another reason why they will consume the larva. And if you let these larvae live, they just grow to be bigger drones. You know, if they isolate them out in the lab and let them grow in an incubator, that's what happens. So, but this is maladaptive to the hive, so the nurse bees don't let it happen. So workers are the result of two different sex alleles and three days of royal jelly that is a little bit different than a queen's royal jelly. All the workers in your hive, so let's say you've got 30 or 40,000 bees in your hive, they are either half sisters or full sisters. And people who work in the industry refer to full sisters as super sisters. Super sisters are workers that the egg obviously comes from the queen, so they have that set of genes. And the super sisters, they all come from sperm from one of the donor drones during mating. So they're full sisters. And they know this, and they can tell. And they work together in different tasks, and super sisters will favor people with the, or other worker bees with their genetics over the other workers. And this is going to be important in a minute here. Slide, please. Okay, and we talked, hopefully everybody knows this, that this is where queens come from. Two different sex alleles and royal jelly until the cell is capped. Um, who decides when the hive gets a new queen? Is it, is it the old queen? Does she no. say, I'm done? No. The workers. No. It's the workers. Yeah. So slide, please. So supersedure. Like we were talking about, poorly bred queens get superseded. If they come back and they've only mated a dozen times and she's done being ready to be mated, the workers in the hive will know this, and they know that being poorly mated is not the most beneficial for their hive. They want to have a diverse group of workers with diverse genetics for control of diseases and to split into specializing in a different kind of tasks and behaviors in the hives. Injured queens get superseded. Let's say you just rub your queen a little bit when you're putting a frame back in. Or if she gets injured on her mating flight. Or if a bald-faced wasp gets in the hive and she somehow gets injured, or it just gets too hot and she gets baked a little bit. You know, you buy a $35 queen and they ship her from Hawaii for another $50 and it gets on your porch 
and the ding dong from UPS that's afraid of bees throws the package in the sun on your porch and runs away screaming. <laughs> she can get injured by tossing that package or sitting in the sun or being bumped around too hot or too cold when in transit. And your now $85 queen will get superseded. Yeah, it's, it's happened to me. Yeah, it does hurt. I've run home from work early twice because I got a notice that they left my bees on the front porch instead of putting them in the shade in the shed like I asked them to. And I had a serious discussion with the lady down at the UPS shop. And now they put all my packages in the shed, too. Right. Everything goes in the shed. They didn't do the same thing, mate. Yeah, because I said these... car. Yeah, I said these are living things. And people have had their queens put on the hood of their truck and set out there in the sun. They, did, they don't know. It's, it's okay. Um, so sick queens also get superseded. Um, queens with nosema, queens with mites. Um, a thing about the queens with mites, you don't necessarily see mites on the queens, but um, you know, like I posted on Facebook last week, you don't see nearly as many mites in your hive as you have. You really have to test your hive. Now, obviously, you cannot alcohol wash your queen. You can only alcohol wash your bee once. So, um, but if the viruses from the mites have been introduced in your previous queen, there can be problems with the next egg that makes another queen because the viruses can already be in there and crossed into the egg. And so that queen could come out sick from viruses from mites. So it's really important to stay on top of your mite game. Um, newly introduced queens with any of the above or alleles that don't match bees in the colony get superseded. How many of you have introduced a queen, thought she was a great queen, big fat belly, you bought her, she's the same race as all the other bees in your hive, you let her sit in her cage, secluded for five to seven days, take the tape off, they let her out, and they kill her. Who's that happened to? Dale's. Part of why that can happen is these alleles don't match. They know. And they want to push their genes forward. Richard Dawkins, selfish gene, written in the 60s, you want to push your genetics forward. That's, that's why you have kids, because you want to make more of you for whatever reason. <laughs> I don't know why I did it twice. <laughs> um, so this supersedure will continue when no queens have similar alleles um, to the queen. Um, this happened to me so bad this year that the hive just died. Um, that one that I cut out of the uh, old Purcell schoolhouse, they were really mean. I decided, okay, they're just going to get requeened. I took the queen out. And I ordered a queen and put her in there. And they made a series of about four queens, and they didn't like any of them. And the hive just lost the will to live. And so I just, eventually I just shook them all out and decided, OK, I've got more wax for my beard and mustache wax business. This talk is sponsored by my beard and mustache wax. <laughs> so that can happen. Uh, slide, please. Can I rotate it? What'd you do? No, I meant this off. I was just trying. Oh, it's too big. Oh. Um, you could scoot the product. The projector a little bit that way or just leave it. So you can't talk about bee genetics without people wanting to talk about defensive bees and what kinds of genes and what kind of races make the most honey. And some of this information comes from um, Lawrence O'Connor <coughs> and the rest came from personal email communication with Randy Oliver. You guys know who Randy Oliver is? So he's really nice. Send him an email, in a few days you'll get an answer. He's a great guy, runs a website called Scientific Beekeeping. His contact information is on there. I think his phone number might even be on there, but there's nothing ever important enough for me to call him because I hate to talk on the phone. So, 
So I knew I couldn't talk about genetics without talking about defensiveness and honey production. Lots and lots of people think, well, really pissy bees make a lot of honey. There's actually never been ever a study that correlates the two traits. Ever. Defensiveness is absolutely genetic, and Randy told me that it is very easy to select for gentle bees. You just don't let queens that make pissy bees go forward in the bloodlines of your apiary. And within a few generations, you'll have really gentle bees. What makes more honey? They've never found genes associated with making more honey. So there's not genes that are associated with the defensiveness gene that will make pissy bees make more honey. So you get more honey production by having good genetic diversity in your hive so that they can specialize into all the different jobs that go into making a lot of honey. Can you guys tell me all the jobs that are involved in making honey? Gathering. Gathering. The Gathering what? The pollen or the nectar. Yeah, and you need both because you need good nutrition in your hive, you need carbohydrates, and you need protein from the pollen. What do they put their honey in? Wax. Wax. So you need bees that specialize in building wax and capping wax. Okay, so you've gathered that. Um, we've talked about foragers. Who do the foragers give their honey to? Yeah, house bees. And the house bees transfer that around. And then... I was just going to say healthy bees make honey. Yeah, healthy bees make honey. And you get healthy bees by having more diversity too. They, they fight off the diseases that keep all the workers healthy. Um, you need bees that are good at fanning off the honey so it gets dehydrated so that it doesn't um, ferment. So that it'll be good for the bees in the winter. You need all of these things, and you get all of those things from having healthy bees and good genetic diversity in your hive. So that's why the bees do this stuff. Um, yeah, his website is awesome. For, for the first bit of beekeeping, so um, for a living, I specialize in evidence-based practice in healthcare, and for a long time, I was looking for somebody who did beekeeping just like this because nursing and healthcare is one of those fields where we do things because we've always done them or just because I learned it 30 years ago when I got out of school and things changed. So the whole thing about um, evidence-based practice in healthcare is making sure that new practices just don't sit in a library somewhere. They move forward to make patients better now. I was looking for the same kind of thing in beekeeping, and I had a very hard time finding this. You search on the internet, and you find a lot of wives' tales, very few controlled studies, and a lot of opinion. So I, I respect this guy quite a bit for doing the work, and also for putting it out there for everybody for free. We're trying to get him to come here. We'll see if we can do it. Um, if we do get them to come here, we'll try and get all the clubs in the area to come see them at the same time. So, so can I get a... So, we've talked about who's had trouble introducing new queens. So, let's say your hive makes a queen. This happens all the time, right? They swarm, the queen gets old, they need a new one. Let's say you're going to start producing queens. So, can I get the next slide, please? I think this is the next slide. Oh, the back one. I'm sorry, that's wrong. So, when you have them, one of the reasons we say knock off all the cells except for your two best ones is if you leave a dozen queen cells in that hive and they all emerge, there's going to be a lot of fighting in that colony. And they're going to talk about who's going to be queen. And you can have a really good queen get injured that way. If you can narrow it down to your two best candidates, the fight's not going to be as long, and the one that survives less likely to get damaged. 
But the queens are not the only ones fighting when they do this. When they watch this behavior in the hives, and they put little markers on all the workers saying who's full sister, who's super sisters with who and who's half sisters, they will get their gang to be behind them. So if somebody's got a <clears throat> AM allele and the other and the other queen has an AL allele, all the AMs are gonna try and hold the AL queen down so that the AM queen can kill her. What I'm saying is that the bees, the workers that are of the same sex alleles as the prospective queens will fight on the side of the queens with their same alleles. So, it, it is, and so, I talked to Dale a lot this spring because I was converting a bunch of hives over from Carniolan to Saskatraz, and I was having a hell of a time getting them to let queens survive. And I think it's because they're genetically different enough where the sex alleles didn't match up, and it was really hard to get them to accept those queens. Because I was trying to put one race of bees into there. So. Any questions about any of that? Yeah, Linda. I'm totally new. No, no yeah. Okay. How would you know that this is a good queen cell and this is a good queen over pigs? Long and fat is good. Um, what if they're the same two? Alleen, same two? Uh -huh. Then it'll just come down to the two of them. One of them is going to be bigger than the other one, probably, and we'll be able to win the fight. Um, Lawrence O'Connor says in his book that size is everything <laughs> with a good queen. It's easier for her to win the fight to be queen and she'll also make a better queen. She'll be a better layer. You want a queen with a big, long, fat belly on her. So it just makes a better queen and more likely to win. But you won't know the alleles of her. No, the people who do these allele things spend a lot of money on it. Um, like Dale said one time, he felt real bad for the uh, graduate student who had to count and number all the bees and find out what they were doing to find out that 5 to 10 percent of them do nothing. I read something else about that this week. Um, there are bees that sit out on the porch of the beehive and just walk around and do nothing all day. I, I've worked with people like that. They go and have cigarettes all day. Um, Yes, yeah. we've, we've all had that coworker, right? Um, so, can I get another slide? So, this becomes a real practical thing in beekeeping when you look at packages versus nukes. Um, we get nucleus colonies from um, Missouri Buzz Bees here, and a nucleus colony is just a small, functioning colony with a laying queen where everybody's related. They have better success rates. The queen's the mother of the bees in there. They share at least one sex allele with the queen. They're in their working groups as a functional hive, and the sister groups are all intact. When you get a package, a lot of times it travels a long way. So that's like one problem with the queen, right? We already talked about that. Queens can get damaged when you travel, things can get hot. My dad used to, I grew up in a family where both my parents worked two jobs all the time. So my dad's second job for a while was working in a trucking terminal. Every spring they had a talk about what to do with the bee packages. And they'd have bees flying around in the terminal for about a month because they were shipping these things. And those guys aren't all beekeepers. They just, some of them are worried about getting stung and they don't take care of the bees like we would. Um, when they shake bees in a package, if you've ever seen a video of this, you can find the video of that on YouTube. They're just shaking bees. One guy's sitting down here and he's got a scale and he's telling them more bees, more bees, more bees, stop. You know, they shake five or six pounds of bees in there to get you three pounds that are alive when they come to you. Um, so some of the bees will be dead in there. And also, um, 
they're not necessarily all from the same hive. So they don't form into um, these sister groups that work together as rapidly as the ones in nukes. They have no idea if the queen's related to any of them. I mean, the people who are making packages also make queens, but there's no way to guarantee that that queen has any genetic similarity to the workers that they've shaken into the package. And they're not a functional colony to start with. They're just a lot of bees, and then they have to figure out how to get it together and form a colony and live long enough for the queen to lay enough bees where they're all hers. And then they can establish. Now, some people have great success with packages, but my understanding is this club, for a long, long time, could only get packages, and there were a lot more problems getting people started off. You know, you're a new beekeeper, and you're super excited. You can only afford one package. You scrap everything together, and you get your package, and you get your hive, and the day comes, and you dump them in there, and you introduce your queen, and next week you come out, and they're all gone. Right. Oh, that still happens with nukes sometimes, but not nearly as often in packages. So genetics is playing a very important role in this process. Do they not ship nukes because of the weight? It's the weight and also think about how a nuke sits in that box. You've got this cardboard box and even just making the trip from Nixa to here on Alexa's truck bed, some of those frames will slip down a little bit off the cardboard box. And it doesn't cause too much damage in that little trip from Nixa to here. But let's say you want to cough up a bunch of money and you want to give Ray Oliveras $300 to ship you a nuke from Central California. It's got to go on the plane and those things are going to shift and then you see the frames rock back and forth, so there's going to be trucks, there's going to be the airplane, there's going to be pressure changes, there's going to, it's just really impractical. And even if you did it strictly by ground so you can avoid the airplane issues, there's still going to be a lot of rocking and moving and they're probably enclosed and they might overheat too. Because it's already kind of warm out there when they start shipping bees, because they're ahead of us, that's why they can ship us stuff in the Midwest. And if they get stuck going over the mountains and somebody turns over, turns on the heat in the yeah. back of the truck, yeah. what they should do is leave the heat off. Because he didn't. Yeah. Any other questions about this stuff? So packages go for what? $80, $90? $110? $110, $120? $110, $120? $110, $120? $110, $120? $110, $120? $110, $120? $110, $120? $110, $120? $110, $120? $110, $120? $110, $120? $110, $120? $110, $120? $110, $120? $110, $120? $
we went through the packages as well, and they really didn't have that big of a difference in their size at all. And so I really thought that the packages would keep up. Just like uh, I was afraid of, they just keep monotonous, boring looking the colonies. And you're fixing to see. And this colony right here is queenless. So we're going to be able to do some interesting stuff on this one. And it's just unbelievable how big of a difference it makes. Now, I don't think it's all genetics. I do believe that our genetics are better than the average commercial strain. But I, I do think that their queens would do fine if they were mated properly. I feel like that's the biggest problem is they're not mated properly. Because I'm not seeing any signs of disease. I'm not seeing any type of signs of furora problems, and there shouldn't be because they're young and I hit them with oxalic acid vapor about eight days after we installed them. So it's, there's no signs of disease. There's no signs of anything except a poor queen, which is just pathetic because if you have a poor queen, then you're out of luck. Now, I just wanted to show you this for an example. This is a split we made. Look at all those bees. They're even drawing some comb over there, eating that patty up. This is the parent column. I checked this to feed it. Oops. Oops, small high beetle. Ah, not anymore. <laughs> Look at all those bees. Look at all those things. Eating on that patty. When I was going through them just a little bit when I threw that patty on, they had five frames with brood on them. So between these two colonies, we'll probably end up splitting them again later in the year. If things, if the, both of them, if their queens keep chugging away the way that they've been doing, then it's going to be great. This is the other new. These are from our April 21st, something like that. And stuff. And look at those bees. There's just bees everywhere. Now let's look at the packages. All right, so this one's in the best shape as of last week. Notice how those have all drawn their combs out. This is the best one. This one's not too bad. It's got a decent bit of bees under the lid. These the boxes are wet because I was watering the raspberries earlier. It's been dry here. Man, we're going to go ahead and dive underneath so right now in the next box. The small hive beetles are really starting to be seen a lot more lately. It's just that time of the year. Oh, by the way, there's a, the patty. Boy, they're not eating that really hard, are they? They might be doing more damage underneath. All right, so since we did the last video with the packages, which was almost three weeks ago, each one of these has received three gallons of syrup, actually a little bit more than that, and at least two pounds of patty. Minimum. Plus we've had a little bit of pollen coming in. So check this underneath here, and look how much they've drawn. They've got this one drawing, these three are eh, kind of, most of these are kind of, and these two here. Poor queen. This poor queen. Now I have had commercial queens that were like this, and when they raised a proper, good super procedure queen off of those genetics, she was great. But she was mated properly, and I really think it comes down to that. There's no signs of disease in here. I gotta take it easy. I kinda hurt my back this morning a little bit. It's not because of the deeps. I was handling something awkward. So let's see what we have here under this patty. They're eating that to a degree. Now if you get a patty that has a lot of larvae in it, if I see it just a tiny bit, I'm not too freaked out. What in the world is that cat doing? I'm telling you, boy, as long as it's not climbing on me with those things. But as long as the larvae, the small high beetle larvae, aren't too bad, I'm not too concerned. But it's kind of part of learning how to feed patties. One, they need to be consuming it good. You need to make sure the bees have plenty of access. You also need to make sure that you don't put on too much. And it's a little bit of an art form. 
like that colony over there, we have a frame, uh, I mean, uh, a feeder rim. I never can get that, right? I don't know why, but that feeder rim really helps them consume it. Plus, you have to have healthy bees in a colony that's brooding hard that really fills the urge to consume a lot of protein. And so if you don't have these factors, um, then they might not consume it as fast, so you might create a lot of those small hive beetle larvae, which is a problem because it only takes about three, well, it takes about three to 12 weeks for those larvae to go out of the hive, drop down below, and, and pupate in the ground. Now, depending on your soil, depending on the temperatures, how long it takes them to go through their uh, uh, pupa stage and then turn into an adult beetle, and then they're flying back to your hives. Hey, back for more. And there's things that we're going to show you that can help you deal with that. I can't really do it because it's too expensive on a commercial scale, but for a hobby, I think it's a great idea, so we'll be hitting that um, shortly. Now, this, this again is the best of the package hives, and it is okay, but let me, just because we see a lot of bees doesn't mean that this long term is going to be a great colony. And I'm fixing to show you why. So again, they have feed, they have been fed, there's even a little bit of pollen coming in, but let's look at the pattern. You know, not every frame has to be perfect. Things happen. Frames get full of food. All right. This is hatching out right here. That's halfway decent. Queen's laying in this frame. There's eggs down in there where the bees have been hatched out already. Stick this frame over here. So what I'm wanting to do is to keep this colony because it's the best of the packages. With the original queen, we're going to baby as best we can and just see what they do. And then we're going to have to work on the other two. I want to replace the queens in both of those. And like I said, this one in the middle on this row, wow, that looks a lot better. Okay, the last time I checked this, the pattern wasn't near as good, but we've been feeding them solid for a little while. That doesn't look too bad at all. Still, though, why have they not drawn as much comes as the nukes? They've been fed more than the nukes. And they weren't that much smaller, if they were at all smaller. So we're just going to keep the feed onto this colony here. So we don't have a bunch of those combs drawn above, and they still haven't drawn this one out. That one over there is not all the way drawn out. But there's eggs down in there, there's larvae over here. Alright, so that concludes our inspection on this one. Let's throw it back together and let's get to the queenless colony. I hate bees that don't reclaim themselves, but it's a great way to get them out of the gene pool. Now, if we were not doing this for, you know, kind of show and tell, I would probably just consolidate that colony into another one because I don't have time for that in real life. This is real life, but in her business life, if I have a colony that gets like this one right here, I'm just condensing into another colony. I, I can't take the time to just uh, throw a queen in there and try to fix it up. Now, if it was partially my fault, it was, the queen was obviously a while ago because there is very little brood in there. If there's any right now, I doubt there's any. They've got weight up here. I guarantee you, though, had we not been feeding this colony, they wouldn't look near as good as what they do. They'd be going backwards big time. And that's why you can't just listen to information like some of those people will tell you, oh, I never feed my bees. I just stick them in and let nature take care of everything. <laughs> some people are that just that lucky, I guess. The rest of us have to work for it. Alright, so keep in mind that queenless colonies can sometimes be very aggressive. You can have a colony that's as gentle as a kitten and then come back a few weeks later or a month later and that queen's uh, been replaced or they're going through a super seizure or whatever and that colony will staple your socks to your ankles. Alright, so we're just going to go ahead and jump on down. I've already checked this top box. There's only like three frames that are completely drawn up here, which is so frustrating because comb is so valuable. They do have a decent bit of weight in the frames that they have. 
but there's just no brute down in here anywhere. There's just, there's no queen, nothing. I mean, look how small this colony is too, and these bees are getting older by the day. There's nothing, and I think I've already checked them. So one of the things that we're going to do to try to salvage this colony, it's not as easy as, oh my goodness, I'm queenless, because if you're at this stage and there's no brood in the hive, you're already in the 11th hour. This is one of the reasons why I'm really hesitant um, to recommend walk-away splits to people. Because if you make a walk-away split, say you did exactly what we did over there to that bee, and you had just done a walk-away split with it, it takes almost 49 to 50 days, you know, probably 45 to 50 days, depending on how quickly your queen comes back from mating flights and weather conditions and all that stuff, if she comes back, before she comes back, lays, and then her brood hatches out. But if she doesn't come back, then that colony is going to have to be combined with another colony quickly because bees are extremely reluctant. And that is why in a case like this with these bees here, there's no brood in that colony. Zero. They tried to supersede and it fell. And so that colony, I should have gone on top of it quicker. I just didn't check them. I was just feeding these colonies. And one of the reasons I found out that this colony was queenless is because they stopped eating their patty completely when the rest of the colonies were consuming it. And that's actually a Feeding is a great indicator on colony health. If you have a colony that's not eating their patties and all the rest of them are, or they're not taking sugar syrup, or they're drowning in their frame feeders when the rest of them aren't, then that could be an indication that your bees are sickly. And, uh, I mean, these, these bees right here, if I stuck one of my mated queens in there, they would more than likely probably kill her. Older bees just have a hard time with it. I don't know how many times I've had a colony that has no brood like this, and you try to requeen them, and they just end up killing your expensive queen anyway. And plus, if you're like me, and you went on your vacation or something like that, and you come back and your colony's like this, then you got to order your queen, if you can find one immediately, and then by the time you get the thing, install it in, she comes out, this colony's dwindled even more. It's a, it's a hard situation, but what we are going to do is give them a little help, and that's why I always recommend that you get to the kind of the point of sustainability. And I really think probably five hives um, to make it easy is a good sustainable number. You can do it with a little bit less than that maybe, but you need some backup nukes or something. Um, it's just really hard to be sustainable with one or two colonies because things happen. I mean, this colony went queen queenless. It wasn't anything that we did. She was a poor queen from the get-go. Now, this one over here tried to supersede earlier, and the brood in it was terrible. And still is terrible. You probably should have just let them do their thing. Well, I did let them try to raise a queen over here. They just didn't do it. Best thing is just to get a good queen from the get-go. All right, so we're going to go into this colony that has a great queen. We are going to help that little colony over there because we need some nurse bees. We need some brood. So let's see what we can find in here. You know, it's getting kind of late for this. He is making space and he's trying both sides okay. his way. So. That's a bunch of hatching out stuff. Excuse me. Yeah, this is great. I can't really find This stuff's done. hatching out. So we get this kind of thing up the We'll give them that one. Move things around and even things out. See if we can find some with some eggs and larvae. That really helps them because if we introduce a queen to that one and we have larvae, then that really helps put the bees at ease. They kind of feel like the new queen you're introducing is kind of helping take care of business even though it wasn't hurt. Alright, there's a little bit of larvae in there. Oh yeah, there's a bunch over here. Make sure we're not shaking the queen. Bunch of really young stuff on this side. I don't know if you can see, but the lighting is pretty dark. And then on the other side, we have some stuff that's just being capped, some older larvae and some stuff that's capped. And the reason these patterns, I believe, are so spotty, I got one going on my shorts. Fun days in the bee yard. That's why you don't wear shorts. All right, so 
<laughs> just because there's been probably nectar and stuff in here, or sugar syrup, I should say. I got this done right here. And so that's why okay, it's so spotty like that. It's her clearing nectar. She's laying and makes the pattern look all funny. All right, so we're going to exchange some frames here. Oh, that's what I was needing. Now we are going to be placing these down here at the bottom. We're going to be removing a couple of these, probably the worst ones. And then we've got to get a queen from Kathleen's princess bees. And that's not too bad of a drawn frame. We'll exchange that out. Maybe this hive over here will finish drawing that frame. But this is why it's so important to have multiple hives, because you can really help this colony out. Now, honestly, again, in, in my business, I don't have time to do this. And I've had this happen, you know, even with some of my fine queens. I had a, a couple swarm in one yard this year, and uh, I didn't have time to just go in there and requeen them or anything. And so I let them see if they would take care of it themselves with the swarms, the super procedure or swarm cells they had left, whatever. And uh, they didn't. They didn't come back. And uh, it just got to the point where we just had to combine them with another colony. We just, we need to focus on our champs, not focus on our wimps. And honestly, high maintenance colonies are not ones that we want to breed for. Alright, so now, it doesn't seem like a whole lot giving them these two frames of brood right here, but this literally is thousands of nurse bees, and so we're going to stick these right in the middle, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to put a queen right in between these combs. We're going to give them a little bit of feed to kind of help put them at ease, just a little sugar syrup, no protein, there's no need for protein right now for them because they won't consume it that good anyways, even with this brew that we're putting in. We're going to put that queen right in between, but we are not going to just leave the candy. I am a huge fan in this situation of playing the long game on queen introductions. There's no reason to rush it. So what I would do is get a cork, something that is not going to let them chew through. I've seen it before where people will plug beeswax, and I tried that one time, and they chewed through the beeswax. It was like a quarter inch thick went through the candy and then still got the queen. So I'm going to stick her in between, probably give them five days with her. Then I'm going to gently go in, unplug that, and then let them shoot through it over the next couple days. And that, I believe, is going to work for me. And we're going to find out, of course, in this video series. So I'll be introducing the queen probably tomorrow. I'll try to do a video on it. But queen introductions, there's a lot of nuances there. Excuse me, bees. All right. Seeing how we can help keep ourselves sustainable, I really do believe that with a little bit of work, we can fix this colony. But you can't just throw in a queen. If they were further gone than that, they've still got a pretty decent bit of bees. I don't... I still would rather... It, Honest. Okay, and then he talks a little bit more about writing some of that. But um, uh, any any questions about what he was doing? You know, the main point of showing that was showing what can happen trying to start up packages versus, versus nukes and the things that happen in there. You know, one of the signs of queenlessness that I've seen a bunch of, especially this summer, I saw a lot of it. Storing tons of nectar, everywhere nectar, because they didn't have anything to do. All the bees get old, they all turn into foragers, and that's what you got. Do you know what kind of queens still are? Well, bees still are? Does that have any, will that have any, make a difference on anything? Yeah, yeah, what's he run? Earlier, earlier in the spring, he, he was doing this as an example, a long term example. He ordered, uh, they were Italians from his friend, and he named her. She's a solid beekeeper. I've heard her before. Yeah. Uh, he just got them. They were a gift, uh, and he didn't purchase them. So this was an experiment. So, 
So he was gifted Italian packages. All, all three, he did, what he did in the very beginning of the spring was, this, is a, this was about a month ago or less, he yes. started with three packages and three didn't start at the same time to show the differences in, in what happens and the, the different genetics. Now his bees, to be honest with you, I don't, I, he raises his own queens, but I do know for a fact that he, like a lot of commercial beekeepers, they like the darker queens. And so uh, it's probably a mixture of, of everything, the darker queens. So. Probably, probably some mixture of Russian and Carniolan or something yeah, to get those yeah. dark queens. Yeah, uh, and the Saskatraz, the, yeah. every year it changes, but the last time I looked was in the early spring. And when I say early spring, I'm talking about January, February. Uh, it was something like 60% this year's queen, this year's uh, beads were going to be a Saskatraz beads. We're going to have 60% uh, Carniolan blood. So, and that's just, just the way it is. Uh, these, these hybrid bees that, that you're getting, it will change from year to year like that, so. Yeah, like last year, um, the, uh, the nukes we got came with dark queens, and this year they all had those golden abdomens. Yeah. I mean, things will just change in the gene pool and that'll crop up. Um, an important thing he does when he's trying to requeen that hive, and it doesn't have much to do with genetics specifically, but you know, that hive was full of old bees. And you tell they're old bees because they look a little darker, no fuzz on them. You know, kind of like when men get older, they get less fuzz on them. And, uh, and they get a little crankier, you know, like men when they get older. Um, and they're not ready for a new woman in their life either. So We become intolerant to stupidity and age. <laughs> so, so, uh, so if you're going to try and save that colony, if you have one of those that does that, you've really got to be able to swap some frames out. You know, this is one of the reasons why we say you should have at least two. Um, when I jumped from 5 to 16, 15, well, 15 to 19 has been kind of the story of my summer, um, I've gained the ability, if I have a hive that just decides it's lost its will to live, I combine it with another one. I don't feel like playing that sixty to eighty dollar gamble, getting that queen. Alexa really didn't have any queens this year, and so I couldn't just run over there. And so you can combine. But what's nice is when you can pull brood from other hives to help out. So if you can have at least two, and one of them's healthy, you can balance things out. Um, there, I think at the Arkansas meeting. There's a speaker that's going to talk about balancing your hives out for production. It's an important thing to do. So, any questions about what Cayman was doing there? And Dale and I have talked about this a little bit. We, we select what videos we're going to share on Facebook and stuff and in here. You can't just go on whatever's out there. But why he is helpful to our club is he's basically at the same latitude in Tennessee. The weather may be a little different, but a lot of our weather kind of pushes that way too. So he'll kind of have similar kinds of years so he can learn off what he's talking about. And he does solid evidence-based stuff. But he doesn't wear a pizza. He breeds, well, if, if you if, if you watch videos with... Um, but I mean, he wears a hat, but you know, they all, but he doesn't put the rest of it. I put him shorts and shorts and shorts. That's true. Um, if you watch if you watch Randy Oliver's videos, the same thing kind of happens in the University of Guelph. One thing that they do that maybe a lot of us aren't doing in our hobbyist bee yards is they have bred very strongly toward gentle bees, and they do not tolerate the kind of behavior where you get your socks stapled to your ankles. And I had my sock. I was wearing shorts and a veil at Steve's house the second time I went out there, and I'm not kidding. I was wearing shorts, and I was still I was pulling stingers out of my socks that were holding my socks down to my ankles. That really happens. There's there's a breed of bees called ankle biters. Um, question about yeah. he's talking about feeding. Does he mean sugar water and, and the patties or just yes. the patties? Yes. Both. Both, and it depends. And you know, you notice he was saying 
that one that needed to be requeened don't give them any pollen right now. They don't have a queen, so they don't have that kind of need for protein right now. But once they go to queen established and so forth, then they will need that pollen to be able to make bee bread and so forth. And he's a commercial guy, so he doesn't have the time to wait for them to go out and gather all that stuff. <laughs> if he wants to push something, he buys the patties and he puts them in there. Because I would guess he's got a hundred thousand dollar business going, if not better. It seems like he's about five or six hundred dollars. Yeah. Yeah, so he's got the kind of money to push those things, to build up production, and it, as hobbyists we don't always feel like spending thirty dollars to buy a box of pollen patties, you know. Okay. So is there a protein patty too? Is that the pollen patty? Pollen patties are pollen yeah. Pollen patties. The dietary component that pollen makes up is protein. Think about how you would feel if you ate nothing but three musketeers bars for two weeks. Lots and lots and lots of carbohydrates, lots of simple sugars, no proteins, no amino acids, no vitamins. You're going to start to feel really bad after a certain point in time, even though you're smiling like that right now. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm thinking diarrhea. Right? Yeah. Oh, that too. Well, you would have to bring yeah. uh, Any other questions about the genetics? Any comments? No. Any? I like the name of the book. Just the one thing. Yeah. Did you notice what he did? He pulled. He looked for specific ages of brood to put in there, and he put them right in the middle. And right. what he's doing is, because those bees are so old, an open uh, frame of egg and brood at that age emits a pheromone scent that is inducing for the bees to calm down and gentle down. And he's giving it 24 hours. You heard him say, I'll give it 24 hours, then I'll put it in clean air tomorrow. The reason why you're doing that is so that that pheromone scent will spread across and calm those bees down, and they'll be less likely to be aggressive towards that queen going to introduce. Even though it's going to be in a cage, by the way, they can and they have killed queens in cages. So uh, ask Shelly. Mm -hmm. She had it happen. But, but no, I, oh, I agree. You're, just, you're I, agreeing with the queens getting killed in inside cages? Three days later, when I went back, she's dead as a boy. Another important thing when you re so if you if you take a queen out of a hive and want to requeen, wait at least a day or two before you put the new one in there. They have to have that queen pheromone dissipate. Let them know they don't have a queen, and then when you put that cage in there, knock all the little queen cells and cups they're trying to make off, and you're going to have to do that again at least before you take the tape off and let the queen out. So I was just out at Steve's a week ago, knocking queen cells off and taking the tape off his cages. So, and you got to get every one of them. Yeah. And what you can do in that situation that you don't normally want to do, unless you know exactly where the queen is, you can pick every frame up and shake it out over the hive and get a really good look because you're not worried about damaging an existing queen and put it back. And I went through and I shook every one off and looked at it. And then I took it off. Because if you miss one, like I talked about before, that fight between queens, they could end up favoring the genetics of this virgin that hasn't even bred and kill off your $30 to $70 queen. So, and I guess you can spend $1,000 for a queen. <laughs> so, you don't want that to happen to her. So, all right. Any other questions, comments? Like just no, ready. just, are you done? I, I guess I'm done unless there's anything else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.